Of course, freedom involves many other things. One point that's worth making is that even though there's been a lot of work on this over the past 30, 40 years, we, st we still don't have a complete picture of what freedom really meant to the people who were coming out of slavery. Where did their ideas of freedom come from? Stephen Hahn, in a recent book, the scholar, argues that we need to take seriously what he calls sort of the political outlook, the political views of slaves. That slaves themselves had a, he's still using political in the broadest sense that, uh, about how society ought to be organized. Um, in other words, their views of freedom come out of slavery. Other people say no, it comes out of emancipation. The crisis of emancipation propels people into different views of freedom. Or maybe it comes out of observation of the white world around them. They see how people are living in freedom, and that helps to shape their idea of what freedom is. Um, to some extent, of course, freedom is a negative, a negative definition. Whatever slavery was, the opposite is freedom. And so in many ways, in 1865, in this moment of transition, you see efforts to throw off the legacy of slavery in very intimate, personal, local ways. People take new names. They throw off the name of their owner and take, uh, and take some other name. In, in the one school in Savannah had among the pupils a guy, uh, someone called Alexander, these are blacks, former slaves, Alexander Hamilton, Franklin Pierce, even General Joseph Johnston, a Confederate general, uh, or other names, Hope Mitchell, Chance Great. These are people taking names which embody what they think is going to be happening. Or another way is, is this thing of looking at whites. Uh, Henry Adams, not the famous writer, but a former slave who testified before a congressional committee said, they asked him, what do you think is freedom? He said, if I cannot do like a white man, I am not free. Whatever rights, opportunities, options are open to white people, blacks should enjoy, otherwise they are not free. But beneath this, more than just a negative, it's, I think the critical point uh, for most of these former slaves was freedom meant autonomy, independence. Independence from white control of their lives. And this is manifested in all sorts of areas of life. It's manifested in religious life. We will talk about this down the road, but one of the key transitions in Reconstruction is the creation of the black church. There had been black churches, of course, before the war in the North, some for free blacks in the South. But now as a mass institution, the independent black church separating out. Blacks used to worship in interracial churches in the South or as slaves secretly, you know, in, in meetings that their masters didn't even know about. But now it becomes a full-fledged, open, autonomous institution with black preachers, black trustees, and becomes for, cent you know, for law over a century and a half, the most important institution in black community life. That is really a pro it dates back before the Civil War, but as a mass institution, it's a product of, the, of Reconstruction and Emancipation. Um, and of course, as we know, and we, black preachers emerge as major political leaders, everyone from Reconstruction figures all the way down to Martin Luther King Jr. and many others in more recent times. Another illustration, which we will talk about more down the road, of this quest for independence is this desire for education. Everybody commented on this tremendous thirst for education among African Americans, not only children, but adults, uh, everybody. This was ubiquitous in the post-war world in the South. That did not come from observing whites. The white South did not have public school systems before the Civil War. The idea that everyone should have an education, no, nah, that cost money and they didn't want to spend money. But, you know, sure, planters' children were educated, but there were no public funded school systems in the southern states with the exception of North Carolina, I think, before the Civil War. Um, and uh, in the Janap book is this famous letter by an ex-slave to his owner, uh, Jordan Anderson, the slave, who's asking him to come back and one of the things that Anderson says in that letter is, well, have you set up a school? I'm not coming back there unless there's a school for uh, my, my children. Um, this desire for freedom was manifested in 1865, in the, after the war ends, in many ways, in 
simple movement of, of the black population. Many people just tested freedom by, you were not allowed to leave plantations without the permission of your owner, without a pass. Now you could travel wherever you want. The whites complained, blacks were just kind of wandering aimlessly around. Uh, uh, the roads were full of blacks going nowhere apparently. Um, and many, many converged on southern cities um, where there was less violence than was going on in the countryside and maybe job opportunities other than working out in, in the fields. Um, so, but most of this movement was very local. People moved a few miles, a, a little bit. It's not, it's not like there was massive disruption, but it was still a way of asserting your, your freedom. This kind of movement was also related to a second critical thing that's going on here, which is the reconstitution of black families. First of all, of course, stable family life was an essential element of people's concept of freedom. Under slavery, there was no such thing as the black family as a legally recognized institution, although many slaves had families uh, and lived in family units, but of course those families could and were frequently, could be and were frequently disrupted by sale. The massive sale of slaves from the Upper South to the Lower South disrupted, you know, thousands and thousands of, of family uh, units. The Army, the Freedmen's Bureau, promoted, um, promoted legalization of marriage in the aftermath of slavery. Here's a little um, lithograph, a family record. This is something that was marketed to former slaves to record their marriages and births and with this highly idealized picture of the aftermath of slavery. Up in the, we have a very middle class black family here in a house with kind of velvet curtains and uh, the, the, the husband, wife, and two children here in the home. And then at the bottom, we have visual images of before the war and since the war. Before the war, working in the fields under an overseer, since the war. Since the war is now, <laughs> seems to be what they used to show before the war. Someone sitting there with a banjo playing, a kid dancing, someone working in the fields, but not nearly as onerous as uh, in the days of slavery. But there was uh, one of the most poignant elements of this moment of freedom was the effort of um, people to, to find relatives from whom they had long been separated. Newspapers in the South and um, Freedmen's Bureau records are filled with notices, letters, asking information about family members who had been sold away. Years and years before, the ads in um, you know, local newspapers, if anyone has any information about so-and-so sold to Mississippi in 1846, you know, my wife, et cetera, I, I would like to get information like that. Um, Freedmen's Bureau records, have, which are in the National Archives, have numerous letters, sometimes listing an enormous number of relatives, cousins, second cousins, stepbrothers, all this. Does anyone have any information of all of these people, when they were sold, where they may have gone to, et cetera? Uh, most of these searches were not successful, obviously. It was very, very hard to track down people who had been sold hundreds or thousands of miles away years before. Sometimes they ended in tragedy when somebody did locate, uh, let's say, a husband or a wife, and they had remarried, and then you had this conflict over which was the legitimate marriage. But sometimes people did reunite their families. But what's, what's very interesting is this remarkable effort to solemnize, you know, these, legalize these marriages. One observer wrote, let the marriage bonds be dissolved throughout the state of New York today, and it may be doubted if as large a proportion of her white citizens would choose again their old partners. <laughs> In other words, everyone said, you're not married, come and marry someone here before the Freedmen's Bureau, turn up with anyone you want and you're married, would you choose? I don't know, I'm not gonna go into that, but um, I'm happily married, so I'm not gonna worry about that. Um, these former slaves also exhibited a, remarkable, a remarkably uh, broad sense of family. The Freedmen's Bureau thought it was gonna be responsible for thousands of black orphans, but they didn't find any because People like, orphans were just absorbed into existing black families. Uh, um, not, not, not necessarily even relatives, but the notion of taking care of members of your uh, community. 
they were absorbed into the black family structure. 